So uh, nice to meet you, everybody. Uh, I, I know that Aaron already did the check to see, you know, who are composers and who are game developers. It looks like we have uh, a pretty decent mix of game developers in here, which is important. Um, the this is kind of a, 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 a not the most accurate title because I'm going to be focusing on licensing, um, and so I want you know I want you guys to keep that that mindset that you know this isn't necessarily going to go into you know, the creative side of this, we're going to stick strictly with the legal framework that you guys are going to be operating in whenever you want to get music in your games, whenever you're a composer and you want to get your, your music placed. So um, without further ado, uh, we're looking at, we're going to start with uh, what is the basic intellectual property that we're going to be working with. And with music, um, you're going to be dealing with several different kinds. Uh, you're obviously get, you're going to have your copyrights, you're going to have your possible trademarks. Uh, that's been brought up a few times. There was apparently some litigation involving Auto-Tune where uh, one of the people who was one of the people who I guess first started using Auto-Tune decided that he was going to sue everybody else claiming trademark rights, which iffy, not really, not really legitimate, but uh, you know people claim it. Uh, an ABC tone is also like there, there are sound marks, things like that, uh, which you know distinguish a particular uh, type of, of uh, company or uh, a type of entity. Um, and then obviously you have patents whenever you're dealing with music technology and a lot of the devices that are used to create music. So um, other things that you're going to need to be looking at, especially when we're looking at license agreements, and, and these are going to come up whenever we're talking about credits, things like that, uh, you're going to have name and likeness rights, personality rights, um, and, and, and pseudo-intellectual property rights, trade secret, things like that, that all might come up at some point. Uh, trade secret is also going to be particularly relevant whenever we're talking about music licensing because obviously people are going to be sharing information about the game, and as you guys learned, you know, there's a lot of trade and you want to keep all of that secret to the extent that you can. Uh, but the one thing that we are going to be looking at the most whenever it comes to music is copyright. And with music, it's kind of a complex animal. It's not as straightforward as uh, what you're going to find with intellectual property in, say, just your game. Uh, with music, you have a copyright in both the sound recording which is you know, the master that you actually record, and in the underlying composition. And who owns those rights is going to vary depending on you know, how you're licensing this music, whether or not you're hiring a, hiring a composer outright, or if you are uh, licensing from a publisher, or if you're licensing from a record label, if you have particular tracks in mind. Um, the type of licensing that you're going to deal with for a game like Guitar Hero is going to be very different from the kind where you're just uh, getting a musical score from a composer. So um, these, are, these are things that you kind of need to keep in mind whenever we're talking about licensing and whenever we're talking about copyrights. So to know the difference um, between the copyright in a sound recording and a copyright in the underlying composition, the best way to take a look at this is whenever you think about a cover song, for example. The cover song itself, the, uh, the composition of that song is going to have one copyright to it. And then every additional cover, every re-recording of that is going to have a different sound recording copyright attached to that. So while you might have multiple copyrights in different sound recordings for the same song, that composition is only, only going to have that one copyright. So what does copyright involve? Well, you get a bundle of rights, and that bundle will include the right to perform it, the right to distribute, the right to record it, obviously, so reproducing it, um, the creation of any derivative works from that product. Uh, in music, you find that less and less, but you know, whenever you have parodies of songs, that might constitute a derivative work. And then, obviously, digital rights and the right to distribute it digitally, uh, to stream it, you know, however you want to release that content. Um, and then what this means in terms of your license is, what you can do with the music is going to depend very much on the bundle of rights that you're getting whenever you license this product, whenever you license this asset. So um, you're going to have to have a good idea of how you want to use that music and what rights you're going to need in order to um, successfully attach this music to your project. Uh, to, uh, the license to a musical composition is going to be different from the license to, for instance, the master. So the kinds of licenses that you're going to need for the underlying work is going to differ whenever we're talking uh, about the license to the sound recording itself. And uh, the types of licenses that you need are also going to vary. So you're always going to need a sync license, and this is re regardless of whether you are hiring a composer or you're licensing through a publisher. Um, uh, the sync license is always going to be obtained through the publisher unless you are licensing directly from a composer. Uh, or you're hiring a composer outright. Um, and this allows the music that, 
to be used in collaboration with your project. So it's, it's basically allowing that music to be attached to an audiovisual work. Um, you may also need to obtain a mechanical license. You guys may be familiar with, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about controlled composition clauses and record contracts. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with that. But what that comes down to is um, anytime you re-record a composition or you are distributing a composition, the record label or whoever is distributing it is, requ is required to pay a mechanical license per copy. And this is a statutory rate estab established under the Copyright Act and established by Congress. So. Um, uh, the, a controlled composition clause in a recording agreement, for instance, will negotiate that rate down so the record label doesn't have to pay the full mechanical royalty for it. For it. But um, you will typically need a mechanical license anytime you're re-recording a song. Uh, and, and this isn't going to be something that you're going to see so much whenever you have a composer agreement. But whenever you are, for instance, uh, Let's say you've licensed a Beatles song, but you don't necessarily want to use a particular recording of that song. You kind of want to record it in-house so it fits your, mute, it fits your game better, or it, it fits the quality of your game better. Uh, whenever you do that, then the mechanical license will, cut, will kick in, and that's something that you're going to want to look into. Uh, where you get the mechanical license from, you can get it from the Harry Fox Agency, and, and you know, it's gonna, I'm going to talk more on that a bit later. Um, and then also you have your performance rights, which, again, all of this comes down to the musical composition. We haven't even touched the sound recording yet. And your performance rights, you're going to get those through performance right organizations, and I'm going to speak to that a little bit later, too. So, um, and the, what you're going to need for the sound recording itself, pretty straightforward. You just have a master use license, and that basically allows you to use the master recording in your, in your game. Uh, your performance, so going into the performance rights, this is kind of a tricky issue when we're talking about games because performance rights, when exactly are you performing the music, especially when we're talking about games? Now, performance rights come down to, uh, the, the time that you see it the most is whenever we're talking about radio, or whenever you see a song broadcast, or whenever uh, there's music in a television broadcast, as, a, as an example. Uh, where does this come up in games? Well, we're seeing more and more that games are being played online, on social networks, and anytime you have music that is reaching a broad audience at the same time, performance rights are going to kick in. So what you need in order to perform that music or to, to have that music broadcast or, or distributed uh, to a broader audience, um, you're going to need to get those rights through whatever agency, uh, performance rights agency or organization your composer or your, uh, the publisher of the song in question is registered with. And obviously you go to them and ask them which one they're with. Uh, if you are licensing a lot of music and using it in your song, for instance, if um, you have like a radio component in your game and you electing or allowing people to kind of pick and choose the music that they want to use, um, then you can get a blanket license through organizations like ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. Uh, Sound Exchange applies specifically to digital distribution or um, online radio, and that applies to the master recording as opposed to the composition. So it's, it's a little different animal. Um, if you are licensing music for, or performing music publicly, uh, through or for a song that's licensed in a different country, you're obviously going to have to get in touch with their performing rights organizations, and I have a few up there. Uh, there's Canada, uh, Mexico, Australia, Hong Kong, Korea. So just kind of make note of those and, and be aware that whenever you are, especially if you're doing online games, which is becoming more and more popular, um, that's something that you're going to have to take, take into account. And uh, and these are the times whenever you're going to really need to, to pay attention to when you're going to need to be using it. And it's, it's, as I said, it's a tricky animal because game developers and performance right organizations and musicians have very different uh, beliefs as to what constitutes performance. Um, whenever you are dig digitally distributing your game but it's not playable online, does that constitute a performance? And that's where we come into the, into the problems of whether or not um, you actually need a performance rights license. So uh, the times whenever you're obviously going to have to, again, as I said, whenever you have your uh, game on a social network, for example, and people are able to play together, or whenever you have an MMO, uh, those are going to be times whenever performance rights are obviously going to, to come into play. Um, and also whenever you are, for instance at, instance, at a conference like this, and you have, your, uh, you have your, a sample of your game playing, and you have the music along with it, uh, the performance rights are going to kick in then as well. Oh, uh, and another issue is whenever your composer holds back these rights. And performance right organizations are being 
very proactive about getting composers and getting musicians and publishers to hold back on certain rights like this, especially performance rights, because they want to make sure that these musicians get paid. Um, and whenever you don't hold those back, whenever you, you, you know, give them away carte blanche, you're not going to be entitled to the royalty that's going to be paid out to you through the performance right organizations. Um, as I said, there are disputes as to when uh, performance, ri performance rights come into question. Uh, and, you know, if it's a standalone game, do you really need a performance rights license? Is it something that, is it the fact that you can download it digitally, you know, qualifying it as, as, a, as a broadcast? Um, that, that all becomes a question, and, and the performance rights organizations want to argue that, yes, even if it's a standalone product, um, because you can uh, download it digitally, you know, that, that constitutes a broadcast. Obviously, game developers disagree, so there's a lot of disconnect there, and when all else fails, it's best to just ask. Um, granted, the performance right orga or rights organization is almost always going to say, yes, by all means, you desperately need a license, and, and, and you're going to pay us a, a large sum for that. Um, but there are exemptions, and there are things that you want to, to kind of find out, and consult a lawyer if you're, if you're not entirely sure, and you don't really want to check with the performance right organization who's going to tell you one way or the other, yes, you need one. Uh, you will always need a sync license, without question, uh, and that is because you can't use music unless it's able to attach to your game. And uh, the sync license is going to be necessary, even if you are purchasing the game outright as a work made for hire, or the music outright as a work made for hire, um, and, and that's because even if it's considered a work made for hire, whether or not it actually is is, gonna, is kind of a question of law and whether or not your work constitutes a collective work. Um, all of these come into play under the Copyright Act. So when all sales, make sure you always have an assignment or some kind of license saying that no matter what, you're allowed to use this music in collaboration with your game. Uh, and uh, as far as... Um, yeah, if you are getting ownership outright, like as a work made for hire, uh, this, it's not necessarily going to be a sync license, it's going to be a general assignment. Um, but, but those are things to take into consideration. So what is a work made for hire versus a license? Well, a work made for hire is whenever you hire an independent contractor or an organization like GAA uh, to, um, like, or an outside entity to create these, this content for you. And in doing so, um, they are giving you all the rights to it. And, and by virtue of the fact that it's a work made for hire, uh, the employer, the game developer, owns all the rights to, that, to those compositions and to the sound recordings, obviously. So, uh, and the way this works, under a work made for hire, uh, it has to be a contribution to a collective work. Uh, whether or not a game is considered a collective work, typically a game like most game development attorneys and most game developers will say that yes, uh, it is a collective work. It's a, it's a, it's a collaboration of assets um, and a bunch of different elements, so that in itself makes it a collective work. It's never really gone to trial, so we're not exactly sure how a court will feel about that. But um, whenever we're Whenever we're talking about you know your 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 agreements with your composers or your musicians, a lot of developers will try to push for the work for hire provision. A lot of composers don't, won't do it. They want to make sure that they have a license and they have uh, control over you know what they're licensing, and and they want to be able to hold back certain things. Um, and the way that this often works is you know they might do the work for hire or have a work made for hire in the, um, in the sound recording itself, but not necessarily the composition and the hold back rights with regard to the composition. Uh, so where do you get this music from? And where do you get these licenses from? You can go on, on like for a lot of uh, casual game developers and a lot of app developers I know of tend to go through online libraries uh, where you know the music can be free or at a reduced rate. Um, I don't necessarily trust the libraries too much because uh, it's very difficult to certify that they actually have the rights to distribute this or to let you license it, and whether or not uh, their rights will go to what you need the music for. So if you want to be able to modify a song, for example, or a track, um, you may not be able to under the library license, whereas if you license directly from a publisher or a composer, you're going to have more flexibility in order to do what you want with the music that you're licensing. Um, a PRO license. By, by the way, uh, the, public, the license that you get from the performance right organization is not a sync license. So just because you get that license does not mean that you can use the music. That's going to come down to the sync license with your, with your composer or your publisher. Also, if I'm going too fast or if anybody has any questions, by all means, just raise your hand. I'm happy to kind of like, take this touch and go. Um, 
So more licenses for musical compositions. So I was saying before you have the mechanical license, which as I mentioned before is the statutory license that you need to get anytime you re-record a song. Um, this is a compulsory license uh, you, that you get when you distribute a re-recorded track. Um, and it goes to the musical composition. As I said, it doesn't necessarily go to the, the specific sound recording. Uh, so when do you need a mechanical license? Anytime you uh, license for, let's say you, again, the Beatles song example. Uh, let's say you uh, are licensing this track from, um, from the publisher. I think it's Apple Music who, who hosts the publishing to still the Beatles tracks. Um, let's say you're licensing that, but uh, you don't want to necessarily use that specific, a specific sound recording of that track. You kind of want to uh, uh, alter it a little bit or you know, put your own spin on it. If you're going to re-record that track, then you're going to need to get a mechanical license for that. And where you get that uh, mechanical license, you can either negotiate it, and you want to try to negotiate this directly with the publisher because you can get a reduced rate at that. And that's, again, the controlled composition, kind of the same principle, where you're not going to pay the full price for the... Uh, for the statutory rate, and you can get a reduced rate, or you can just go with the preset uh, statutory license and get and uh, issue that directly directly to the publisher. Publishers are required to grant mechanical license; they can't say no. It just means that you have to pay them. So there's no way that they can say no. Uh, we are not going to issue this mechanical license. They are statutory; uh, they are statutorily required to grant that license anytime you want to re-record a song. So you never have to worry about getting that one. You can just send one in automatically. There are lots of forms for it, so it's pretty easy to do. Uh, and now for, so we've covered pretty much what you need for the musical composition. We've covered the mechanical license, we've covered the sync license, we've recovered, covered your uh, performance rights license and the things you might need to get from the performance right organizations. So now we have the sound recording itself. And the sound recording is essentially the master track. It's the specific version of the song you want to use in your, uh, in your game. So the questions to ask whenever you're trying to get a master use license, um, unless you're doing this all in-house, you need to be very careful about who's involved in the recording, uh, who's at the studio. Um, you need to uh, know who owns the studio. You need to kind of have an agreement with the studio to make sure that they are not claiming any rights in into the, to the master. Um, and you need to kind of make sure that you have a proper agreement with the studio or the, the people that you're hiring have the uh, proper tools or the proper agreements in place if you're using an outside studio. Um, you need to find out who is performing on the recording, and you need to get waivers and rights from them uh, in order to use their name and likeness, for example. And this goes for voiceovers as well. And you know, anytime you're dealing with the with the guilds uh, in question, the screen uh, I know the Screen Actors Guild has um, um, certain rights as far as as voice acting and things like that. Uh, so you always need to make sure that you get the name and likeness and the right to you know, use whoever's voice is going to be on there. Uh, and then you need to make sure that whoever is in the studio, you get some kind of waiver or statement saying that they are not the owner or they do not claim an interest in the song because you see this a lot where you have some musician's girlfriend who's just you know, hanging out at the studio. You know, she, she makes some offhanded remark and it winds up getting into the song and all of a sudden, you know, two years later, the, music's a big, or the song's a big hit. She comes out of the woodwork after a very bad breakup and says, you know what, I own a part of that song. And it's, it becomes a big mess. So you get a lot of people who will try to claim an ownership in it. You wanna make sure that nobody can do that because that's a major pain in the ass. Um, so your, your goal is to make sure that everybody has signed some kind of release uh, of any potential rights they may try to claim in, in the musical composition and the sound recording in question. Uh, if you're licensing a track instead of hiring, uh, you're, uh, you're going to be going through the record label who owns it, or if you... This is a trickier question. A lot of uh, musicians obviously aren't working with labels these days. They're doing their own digital distribution. Uh, if you are licensing a track uh, instead of, as I said, going through a composer, you need to make sure that A, the musician or the person that you're licensing it from is the sole owner of the recording. Uh, you don't want, again, we're coming back to the question of you know, people who are trying to stake a claim in something that they only had a little bit of an of a, a input in. Um, you want to make sure that whoever you're licensing from obviously owns the rights to the use of the master license. And um, if you are licensing directly from a composer, this becomes a much easier issue. You have more control over the process, and the composer is obviously going to be the primary stakeholder in the, in the master. And um, it's, it's pretty easy to kind of get uh, that addressed in the whatever agreement you have with your composer.
Isn't it like if you're if you're that person that's sitting on the couch while the song was being made, don't don't you have to sign something to, for a chance to get credit for it? Not necessarily. Um, really? Any, uh, that's the thing is that joint ownership doesn't necessarily need a signed writing. Anybody who contributes a substantial uh, or makes a substantial contribution to a project and what constitutes substantial obviously is totally subjective. Um, you know, it might be a very small part of the song, but it was an integral part or it goes to the heart of the song. It's the most distinctive element of the song. Um, that can be considered a substantial contribution to a track. And anybody who makes that contribution can count as a joint owner. You don't necessarily need to have anything in writing. You don't need to register a copyright. Um, you automatically have those rights the moment that something is fixed in a tangible form. So once you have a recording, anybody who contributes to that can obviously, you know, make some kind of claim as being a joint owner. And no, you don't need to have anything in writing saying that. It's always, you do want to have right. one. You always want to have something saying, you know, um, I, I, I'm the person who, you know, created this. I own 50%. I own, you know, 75%. Um, you always want to have something like that, but it's not absolutely necessary under the Act, and it's not necessary to claim an ownership interest. So it's, it's something that you, I mean, this is why you kind of want to have things in writing. This is why licenses are so important, because... Intellectual property isn't something that, it's not physical. It's not something that you can just take possession of. Uh, it's something that the only way that you can transfer rights is obviously going to be through a writing. And, I mean, especially whenever we're talking about non-exclusive licenses, which don't need to be in writing, um, it, it becomes very tricky as to what you can do with music and what you, you, know, what you have the right to do with whatever it is you're licensing. So, um, or whatever it is you're recording. I mean... So yeah, you don't necessarily need to have anything in writing in order to claim a stake in it. Just so you know, still don't do it. It's not very nice. It's a horrible thing to do to musicians. Um. Could you clarify uh, how this overlaps with um, sound effects or like a library of sound effects that get used? Well, well, I mean, as far as sound effects, now obviously there are going to be copyrights and sound effects, so all of this necessarily applies to pretty much anything that's created, any asset that's being contri contributed, or any sound asset that's going into a game. So, and most of this is going to be covered under the same agreement, so if you're hiring a composer to also do the audio uh, or the sound effects, you know, all of these are going to come into play. And the reason is that, you know, even audio effects, even if it's not, um, you know, even if it's, even if it's not as creative, and, or, and it is a very creative process, but even if it doesn't have the same kind of uh, creative connotation that attaches to a musical composition, for example, there's still enough of a creative element to warrant copyright protection. So all of these license terms will also apply to any sound effects, voiceovers, things like that, that are being uh, contributed to the, to the game. So, these, so all assets, this applies to all assets. Uh, the difference is that with audio effects, for example, you may not have the same dichotomy between the sound, the sound recording and the musical composition. You might just be able to get those outright. You always want to be careful because you might have, you can always make the argument that, you know, a, a particular audio asset um, is, is, you know, it has a, a composition quality and a specific recording quality. So you kind of want to, you know, take steps to make sure that everything's covered. But um, generally speaking, yes, it all applies. Um, so, where am I? Uh, so the kind of licenses that you're going to see, so there are typically two types. You're going to have, obviously, your work for hire agreement if you're negotiating with a composer outright or, or an organization like GAA, um, or you're going to be licensing from a record label or a publisher for uh, tracks that already exist. And as for work for hire agreements, you kind of need to be careful. A, they have to be in writing. They have to be an independent contractor, uh, unless you're obviously hiring them outright as an employee, which a lot of people do. You might want to just hire somebody on as a, as a composer, uh, which makes it far easier because as an employer, uh, you own the music or anything created by that composer and the scope of, of work uh, outright. Uh, you don't necessarily, you can't necessarily say that for a work made for hire because there are going to be things like prior works or, uh, you know, separate compositions or things like that or things, you know, pr created outside of the scope or separate uh, or beforehand um, that may not fall under the purview of the work for hire uh, agreement. So you kind of need to be very careful as to what is exactly your licensing and you need to pay more attention to the assets in question than um, the, the specific relationship between you and the composer. So uh, if the... 
if you are, you know, hiring somebody as a workmate for hire and you are taking ownership as a result, and, and that is what a work for hire is. It basically uh, creates a, a, the same or a similar relationship as an employer-employee relationship under copyright law, which means that an employer or somebody who's contracting as a workmate for hire uh, is the sole owner of the, of the property in question unless there are holdbacks or, or other uh, negotiated parts. I was under the understanding that uh, a company cannot be a writer, so they cannot own the writer's rights. The writer's rights are always an individual. So how does that work if the company owns the entire rights to that piece? I thought that there's always, there's always publishing and there's always writers, and the writer can only be an individual or a person. It cannot be a company. Uh, well, I mean, that's... that's they will still, I mean, they can still own the rights to it, and and they may not be credited as the songwriter. Uh, that's the thing is that with. But they can't be, and I cannot pay the company. Yeah, well, for publishing right. purposes. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's it's usually you have the publisher, you have the songwriter, and those those rights tend to be separate. But whenever we're talking about um, this kind, whenever a, a writer or somebody is an employee of a company, uh, that company is still essentially going to to own those rights. Um, it depends on the agreement. He's talking about the PRO. Yeah, these are, these are performance rights, and, and that's going to go, th and that's kind of a different animal whenever we're talking about the performance rights. And the, as far as I know, the PROs don't allow anybody except, yep, except the actual the writer. writers to yep. claim mm -hmm. being uh, the writer. Yeah, so, as for, so yes, for performance rights purposes, then the songwriter is still going to be credited and, and is still going to be entitled to their performance rights, uh, the performance rights royalties. But, uh, the, and the game company or, or whoever is hiring is still going to be the publisher, essentially. So they will take over the publishing rights that are not the songwriter's rights, which I think is about 50% usually. Uh, and then it's, it's divided up between the publisher and the, and the, and the songwriter. So, uh, so yeah, sure, right. As far as performance rights goes, and the songwriter is still going to be considered the songwriter for purposes of, of those royalties. But as far as the actual ownership and who can do what with the music, it's still going to belong to the, to the company who's... who's commissioned it. So just to clarify, that that percentage and that split, it, it doesn't matter if they contracted a uh, composer or if the con composer is on staff. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. Okay. There is, so, so long as there is a, a specific songwriter for performance rights organization purposes, the songwriter is still going to be the one to get the credit. So, uh, um, and again, that comes down to you know what you're negotiating as far as performance rights and, and what you're getting as far as that and when you're going to, to be required. And as I said, in a lot of cases, whenever we're talking about uh, these compositions, whether or not performance rights are even an issue becomes a question. So whether or not that, that actually becomes relevant really depends on how that game is being distributed. Well, there's, the, there's other uses as well. Like let's say the company decides they're going to use the soundtrack for commercials. Mm -hmm. In which case, yes, performance rights definitely become an issue. So, uh, so the so so one of the advantages as a game developer for owning this music outright, or you know, getting this as a work made for hire, uh, it gives you more control over what you can do with it, and that includes how you want to exploit it. It also gives you the opportunity to license that music in turn. So I know that there is a company starting up that's doing mu like uh, game music bundles, and you know they're licensing content from game studios instead of specific composers, uh, and they can do that because obviously uh, those game studios commissioned as work made for hire or uh, hired employees to to create these works for them. So um, it gives you an additional asset that you can leverage, which is great. And it gives you more content that you can make use of whenever you are marketing or, or uh, distributing your game. So what kind of agreements are we looking at? I've already mentioned the work made for hire. Uh, and there's a difference between a work made for hire agreement and a license. And a lot of that's going to come down to holdbacks and what people uh, or what the composer is going to say. You can do this, this, and this, but we're keeping the rights to this. You can't have this. So uh, for, for example, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you might get a work for hire agreement in the sound recording. So, uh, as the as the game developer, you would own the rights to the specific master in question. But for the underlying composition, the songwriter may say, "I'm keeping these rights, and you know I'll license it to you, and I'll let you use it in, in collaboration with your game. But I own those rights, and I'm holding those back. So you don't own those, and you can't um, you can't 
change the song or use it in a way that we haven't agreed to under this agreement. There's also a difference between exclusivity and non-exclusivity. So an exclusive license enables you to be the only person who can use that music. Um, and that includes the, uh, the composer. I mean, the composer can't reuse that music once they've exclusively licensed it to you. Uh, whenever it's a non-exclusive license, these are much cheaper, typically, uh, they can be licensed and relicensed by the composer as many times as they want. Uh, it just enables you to use it in your, in your game, but it doesn't mean that you're the only one who can. So this kind of gives a lot of flexibility. Uh, some other exclusivity provisions uh, may relate to the geography, like where exactly the song's going to be played or where it's going to be distributed. Um, and also the time limitation, anywhere from three to five years, usually the lifespan of the game in question. Uh, and, and as far as you know, when this comes into play, it comes down to how much are you willing to pay for this music. Uh, typically, non-exclusive licenses through these libraries and things like that tend to be a lot cheaper. Um, but again, you get a limited number of rights with that, and obviously you're not the only one who can use it. So you don't get to, it doesn't become your asset, which means that you can't leverage it in the way that you could uh, if, it, if it was an exclusive license or if you uh, contracted as a work made for hire. Uh, if you are not the one drafting an agreement or uh, if, if uh, you are not having it drafted for you, uh, you need to pay very close attention to the rights you're getting. So you need to be very, uh, very attentive both to the musical composition rights and what you can do with the underlying composition and obviously what you can do with the master recording. Uh, and this includes um, obviously use in collaboration or use in, in tandem with the audiovisual recording. Uh, any kind of marketing use or commercial use, you want to make sure that you keep those provisions as broad as possible as the developer. Uh, and obviously the, the contrary side of that is if you're the composer, you want to limit those rights as much as possible or you want to make them pay heavily for them. Uh, you want to keep as much as close to your chest as possible because you don't want control over your underlying composition to get away from you if you can help it. So what kind of holdbacks are we going to see? And, and uh, these holdbacks um, can happen either in employee agreements, work made for hire agreements, or, or licenses. Uh, but you're going to see them most commonly in the licenses. And uh, so as I was mentioning before, you might have a work for hire provision in the master recording, but not necessarily the musical composition. And this is the most common example that I've seen. Uh, you might also have holdbacks, obviously, for the performance rights, which means that um, Obviously, the songwriter is, you know, going to get that, uh, going to get that publishing right in the, uh, in the musical composition. But they also might reserve the publishing right uh, that the game developer would otherwise be entitled to. So, um, and and again, that comes down to whether or not there's an independent publisher involved, whether or not the composer has their own publishing company that they tend to license this music through. Uh, you might also have holdbacks for re-recordings of the work or prohibiting them from making uh, derivative, uh, derivative works from a musical composition, um, and also how the music can be used. So you might, the usage might be limited only to uh, the commercial exploitation of the game itself, but you can't use it in advertising, things like that. Yes, sir. So on your uh, second bullet point up there, who would have the rights for the sound recording and who would have the rights for the musical composition? So the sound recording would be owned by the game developer because that's, okay. that's under the work made for hire agreement. So it's not even licensed, they own it outright is, is frequently how I see this. But the musical composition remains the property of the songwriter or the composer. Um, and this allows the songwriter obviously to uh, make different versions of this song or use it in a, in a different manner, but they can't use that specific sound recording. Did you, were you raising your hand? So I, I'm working with a developer and the back and forth process involves a lot of, uh, well, something like this, do, 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 you know. So how much interest do they gain by, by suggesting and prodding and, I mean, uh, some no. very great suggestions they've mm -hmm. had that I've riffed off of and, yeah. and made some great music off of, but I feel like I still made that music well, like, that's going to come down to your agreement. And, and as I said, like, all of this comes down to what you're going to have in writing. Uh, if you don't have something in writing, that becomes a much trickier issue because, as I was saying before, you know, the slightest contribution may be substantial enough to constitute joint ownership. So uh, worst case scenario is they may not own the 
the musical composition outright, but they may be a, a legitimate joint owner unless you have something in writing that states to the contrary. So what you have in writing is going to be the most effective way of determining who owns what and how. So as a direct follow-up, uh, so we signed a work for hire agreement, um, but a very generic one. Mm -hmm. uh, what, I mean, how? I don't know. I haven't read yeah, it. I, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to be that's going to be a big part of it. Um, it's going to, as I said, it comes down to what is in writing, um, and if if it's a standard work for hire agreement and it's fairly generic and says you know anything that we create or anything that I create uh, on your behalf is your property, which is what most work for hire agreements say, uh, you know that's obviously going to belong to the game developer. So. It depends. Like, did you? Is there a holdback for the musical composition, or are, is everything that you composed for them their property now? I mean, that's what that's that's the kind of thing you have to look for in your work for hire agreement. And unless I see it in front of me, I'm not going to be able to tell you. So, um, I'll let you move on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so read your agreements carefully. Be very careful about what rights you're holding on to, what rights you're letting go of, and uh, and it's, read your agreements. Let know what you're signing. That's the number one piece of advice I can give any composer or any game developer. Know exactly what rights you're getting. Know exactly what rights you're keeping. Um, know what's in your agreement, and be as specific as possible. You know, make sure that you understand that there are two different copyrights in question here, and you've got to deal with the rights to the master recording and the musical composition. So you need to make sure that the agreement that you have in place speaks to both of those issues. And also, you know, the ability to use your voice or the ability to use your name in the credits, all of these things need to be taken into consideration. Uh, your name and likeness rights will come into play. Um, and obviously, you know, even if, so, so moral rights is, is another example. Even if you don't necessarily have moral rights under the U.S. Copyright Act, uh, you can still contract them in. So you can still have a moral rights provision in your agreement that says how this music can be exploited and how it can be used in can here, and you've got can't. So if you don't want your music attached to porn, for example, and you know you don't want it, you don't want that 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 reputation as being a, a music like a porn music producer, but the game studio owns the owns all of the rights to the to the master recording and to the musical composition, and they decide to license it to a particular porn producer, um, that can be a problem for you as a composer. You don't really want your name attached to that particular project. That's not what you signed up for. You signed up for your music to be in a game, not skin. So, um, so, so having a moral rights provision is something that you also want to take into consideration whenever you're licensing or whenever, especially if you are uh, going on as a work made for hire. And this just covers your bases, basically. It protects you and it, it allows you to have a bit more of a say in how your music is going to be exploited. Uh, so what does this mean for the composer? Well, A, as I said before, it permits the composer to maintain more control over uh, what they're composing and you know, what, what the game studio can do with it. And so this is to the benefit of the composer, to the extent that they can you know, hold back certain rights and maintain control of it, over it. Uh, it's great for the composer. It can be a big problem for the game studio. So both parties need to be reasonably flexible when it comes to uh, these rights and these holdbacks and who's owning what. Uh, it, the, and the problem that you're going to find with specific holdbacks, uh, for instance, usage, things like that, is that those can be easily manipulated to make it almost impossible for you to distribute your game if you have this music attached. So you need to be very careful to make sure that whatever they're holding on to, whatever rights they're re retaining, um, they're not going to uh, impinge on your ability to distribute this product, market it appropriately, uh, sell it to certain audiences. And the, what, the place where you're going to see this most is digital distribution because to distribute this product, contracts especially, uh, boilerplate agreements, uh, certain digital rights will be held back and that can really hurt your ability to digitally distribute your game, which is what we're moving towards more and more. So now the important part, because this is the part that everybody cares about, and that's money. Um, and so, so what kind of what kind of ways do composers get paid? Uh, this can vary, and actually, the the two that I have up here are the most common ones. I've had a couple of other ones that I don't necessarily uh, see very often, but they're perfectly viable, and uh, they might give you some more flexibility. The most common that you're going to see is a flat fee. It's either going to be per track or for the particular uh, library in question, uh, portfolio or, or uh, 
you know, collection of works. Uh, it might be for the entire project or the entire game and all of the compositions that are created for that. Or it might be, um, you know, on, on, a, on a per composition basis. And the method of a flat fee payment can either be, you know, outright in the beginning. Uh, usually, the way I see it, the flat fee is paid after the compositions have been incorporated into the game. Um, another way that I see it is you get, you know, a, a percentage up front, and then you get uh, percentages uh, for each composition that's created. So. Um, so, but the flat fee is the most common, it's one you're going to see the most often. If you need a little bit more flexibility and you don't have the money uh, in, in the beginning to kind of finance that kind of, uh, that kind of flat fee uh, agreement, you might want to look into back-end deals, which is going to relate more to the royalty end, and this is going to be based on uh, net revenue from the sale and distribution of the game. Net is going to be based on the actual profits received less um, for instance, the cost of distribution, uh, the costs needed to maintain the maintain the work, uh, the the cost needed to maintain servers, for example, things like that. If it's an online product, um, and any obviously any taxes or price protection, uh, those kinds of things are going to be reduced from the gross revenue to come to your net amount. So be very careful about what net revenue means because you'll get a lot of double dipping. Uh, you might get reasonable reserves, things like that, which. Uh, can all turn into money that you should be entitled to, but you aren't getting. So you need to be very careful about what um, what net revenue means, and you need to make sure that you understand what's going to be deducted. Uh, anytime you have a royalty provision, you also need to automatically look for an accounting provision and an audit provision. So um, the accounting is obviously going to say is going to be the royalty statement, which tells you exactly what money has come in, what deductions are being made from net, what your what your due, and you want to you want this royalty statement whether or not you're actually entitled to money yet. So you want to make sure that they're getting you this royalty statement to you um, the moment that the money starts coming in. And generally, this is done. It can be. It's usually quarterly that I see. Uh, sometimes it's semi-annual, so it's every six months or every year. Um, but for a, for a lot of composers, they want it. They want to keep that on a quarterly basis, so they have a steady stream of income coming in from these from these royalties. Uh, the specific royalty in question. Again, this is going to depend on the definition of net. If you have a more narrow definition of net that, uh, for instance, only has reasonable reserves and price protection, you might want. I mean, you might be able to negotiate a lower excuse me, a lower percentage, um, because you're still going to be entitled to more money at the end of the day. So just having a high percentage number doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be entitled to more money, depending on how net is defined. And that's why I was saying, often the percentage is less important than the definition of net, because as I was saying, you know, you might be entitled to more money, money under a narrow definition of net, even if you are entitled to a greater percentage under a more broad definition of net. So um, and and all of you know the, the specific percentage in question is obviously going to, you know, it's it's going to vary depending on the composer in question, the credibility of the composer, and the reputation, um, and also the leverage of the game studio and whether or not you know they're in a place to say we're going to give you this amount and this is what you're going to have to settle for. But obviously, if the game studio has uh, that much leverage, they can probably play the fat flat fee in the beginning, so this may not even be an issue. Uh, Another aspect that you're going to come in, that's going to come into play with um, royalties is whenever you have, for instance, soundtracks and, and what um, like other exploitations of the music. So more and more, I'm seeing a lot of game studios put out soundtracks for their music or uh, soundtracks for specific games in question. I know WoW has one, um, and the, the composer will obviously want to have a cut in that as well. So you're going to want to negotiate probably a, a, an increased royalty for the soundtrack. Um, or any other exploitation, digital distribution. If the, for instance, a lot of uh, game music is going through iTunes. Um, if, if it's being uh, sold through there, you want to make sure that the composer's cut is, is still negotiated. And this might be something that is, um, that royalty may be a part of the agreement, even if it is otherwise on a flat fee basis. And that's just because with the soundtrack, the, the emphasis is going to be on the music. So even if the game developer owns that music, the fact that the, that the composer is the greatest contributor to that music um, gives a, a sound argument for the composer being entitled to an increased royalty. So as far as 
different models, and these aren't things that I really see very often, but I put them in here because I think they're interesting, and I think that they will give you a lot more flexibility as far as how your composer is getting paid. Uh, you can have a royalty plus uh, maximum threshold, which is um, basically a royalty that is tantamount to a flat fee, because there's a cutoff, there's a benchmark that says, okay, you are entitled to this percentage uh, you know, for the lifespan of the project up until you've earned this much. And once you've earned this much, that's done. That's your fee. That's all you're entitled to. You're not entitled to any other, anything else. So um, not the best deal for the composers, obviously, because if it's a runaway hit, uh, they obviously want to have as, can, as ongoing a stake in that, in that as possible. So maximum guarantee, not always good for the composer. Great for the game developer. Uh, as far as a minimum guarantee, it's the exact opposite. It basically says you are entitled to a royalty and you are guaranteed this particular amount. And if we don't meet this benchmark within this particular amount, we will write you a check for that full amount and you're still going to be entitled to a royalty after that. So obviously this is the best deal for the composer. Um, and it, again, it kind of has that mix between a flat fee that they know that they're going to get a certain amount and, uh, and obviously the royalty component as well. So the best deal for the composer is obviously going to be either the flat fee or the royalty plus minimum guarantee. Uh, the worst for the composer is probably going to be the maximum threshold. And now uh, for the other provisions that you're going to have to look at whenever we're looking at a contract. Um, the contract is going to be all important. This is the thing that, this is the license. This is the rights that you're getting to this music. So you need to be very clear as far as um, what's going into this agreement. So you have the substantive provisions, which are obviously going to be, you know, the license terms, the duration, uh, the term of the agreement, whether or not it's a work made for hire, who owns what, who's entitled to what, um, you know, when the, when the composer has to have this work performed or completed, um, and then obviously how the music can be used. But there are going to be a, a, a lot of other uh, provisions that you need to take into consideration whenever you're looking at these agreements. You've got your warranties and representations, and that's going to, if you're a composer, you want to make sure that you're going to get paid, so you want to make sure that the uh, game developer is solvent, and you want to have a provision in there stating that they will remain solvent for the duration of this project. Um, for the composer, you want to, or if you, if you are the game developer and you're, you're licensing from a composer, you want to make sure that they are the sole owner of all of the rights and into that work and that they have the authority to license the master as well as the musical composition. You want to make sure that there are no uh, conflicts with any record labels or, um, again, libraries or other composers uh, as far as, you know, claiming ownership in that project. You don't want anybody to be able to come back later on and say, I had a stake in that and I'm not getting paid from it, but I should be. So if, they, if there is another owner on the project, you want to make sure that the composer has warranted that there isn't and in the event that somebody does come back and haunt you, um, they're going to indemnify you. And for, uh, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with indemnification, but uh, indemnification is when you are basically stepping in the shoes of the other party who's being sued. So, for example, let's say uh, the, uh, the example I was saying before where some, one of the composer's ex-girlfriends like, got into a fight and was at the studio and claimed, is now claiming a stake in, in the song that's, that is now in your game. Um, if, that, if there's a warranty in there that says, I'm the sole composer on this and I'm the sole owner to all rights and into this, uh, then it's up to the musician, even though it's the game developer being sued, it's up to the musician to step forward and say, okay, I will be on the hook for this because this is what I warranted. I said that this wouldn't be an issue. Now it's become an issue. I'm going to step in in your shoes and, and protect you from this. And the, the duty to indemnify is typically different from the duty to defend. So just because they're stepping into your shoes doesn't necessarily mean that they're obligated to defend you. You always want to have a duty to defend provision in there as well. Three minutes. Okay. So fortunately, I think this is my last slide. So, uh, the other issues are going to be obviously waivers and liability. You want to have everybody, everybody possible sign a waiver. Uh, and that waiver is going to say, you know, I'm not sticking any claim into this unless obviously the agreement says otherwise. And that goes for everybody. That goes for engineers, everything. Whatever agreement that you have with the studio, whatever agreement that you have with the composers, you always want to make sure that you have waivers as far as, um, as, far as liability goes. 
Um, obviously, you're going to need choice of law. That's going to be the law that governs, and that's going to depend on what state you're in, what laws are going to be most favorable to you. This can be a much trickier issue than it seems, and it's something that you're going to want to be very aware of as far as how that state's law is going to impact your agreement. For example, with non-competes in certain states, including California, you cannot have a non-compete agreement. They just don't exist. They're not valid. So if you have a non-compete in there, um, you need to make sure that the choice of law you're using is going to acknowledge that non-compete. Uh, obviously, credits are going to be an issue. Uh, some of these are standardized depending on who you're going to be working with. Um, if you're dealing with voice actors or things like that, they're going to have a separate standard as far as what's required uh, credit-wise. Uh, key man clauses, if you want to have a specific uh, composer and you're working with a particular group, uh, the key man clause will say, uh, you know, we, you have to have this person on the project or this deal is invalid. And then obviously a buyout. Uh, the buyout is if, you know, they, you, they want the opportunity to be able to purchase the music outright at a later time. Um, that's another, obviously, an option. You don't really see that so much in music licenses, but it's a possibility. So, since I'm out of time, do you guys have any questions? Yes. Okay, so if a game company hires a composer and they don't specify the soundtracks, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, they don't plan on releasing one, and it's not specified in the work for hire agreement, and then later they want to release the, the soundtrack, so then what happens? Where does the burden of proof lie? Is it the composer or the company? Uh, the composer comes and says, uh, well, if, I, I mean, it depends. It depends what the work for hire agreement says. If the work for hire agreement basically assigns all of those rights, because in any work for hire agreement, you're going to have, obviously, the work for hire provision, and then you're going to have the assignment. And that assignment is going to basically transfer ownership into the musical composition or the sound recording or both to the game developer. So they can do whatever they want with that music afterwards. And unless you've negotiated in there that you're going to be entitled to a royalty, you're not entitled to anything outside of what's already negotiated in that agreement. Gotcha. So, so the sound, so the composer has really no recourse at that point. At that point, once they've assigned that. that, once they've assigned those tracks, they're not really entitled to anything beyond their performance rights. I had a quick question concerning new casual games such as song pop, uh, utilizing small pieces of previously recorded media. Mm -hmm. Do you feel we should still pay out royalties based on that, like they're a true radio play? Or should there be a contract in place somewhere, considering the fact you're only utilizing 10 to 15 seconds of the actual song? Uh, well, I mean, there are sample licenses, you know, clip licenses, things like that, and all of those go through the publisher. So, I mean, yes, yeah, you need them, because if you use any recognizable portion of a song, you are setting yourself up to get sued. And whether or not, I mean, it depends on the type of game in question as to whether or not performance rights become an issue. And as I said, that, that is kind of tricky, because we're not always sure whenever uh, a, a game constitutes a public performance of a song. Um, but as far as mechanical royalties, because it's a re-recording, mechanical royalties are probably going to kick in, so you're obviously going to have the statutory issue. Uh, and then as far as a sample or a clip license, those need to be negotiated with the publisher. And yes, I do believe that you need to make sure you have those licenses in place, because otherwise you're going to get sued. You don't want to expose yourself to that kind of liability. Are there any other questions? Anyone? Anyone? Now's Anyone? your chance to get free legal advice, everyone. Come on. <laughs> Often we, um, <clears throat> as a composer, we get the, we're, we're doing the music pretty late in the process and mm -hmm. there's a, a rush and sometimes we don't see the contract until the last minute. How long would it take, if we wanted to push back on issues, how long could, you ex could we expect to have to wait to negotiate issues or can you can it give a, any kind of guidelines on that? It, it depends. I mean, it, and that yeah. depends on who you're negotiating with, obviously. I mean, if you... The more leverage you have and the more control you have over what you're creating and, and the less ownership you're giving to the game developer, obviously the more you can push for things and the more you can, you can get feedback from them Im immediately. And also, I mean, what I generally recommend is don't, I mean, to the, at least have the, 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 the preliminary terms established. At least have an idea of, uh, even if it's just a term sheet or a one page that says, you know, the statement of work. You know, at least have that in place so you know exactly what you need to do and, and what you're going to be entitled to. Um, beyond that, for a long form or, or, or a larger agreement, you know, that can wait a little bit. There's, there's a tricky issue with that, and it's one of the reasons as to why every work for hire agreement always has an assignment attached. And that's because a work made for hire, typically, under the law, needs to be 
executed in writing prior to the work being completed. So you can't have a retroactive work made for hire, at least according to the law. So um, you always want to have that in place. Yeah, quick question on being able to secure your writer's rights without a publishing company in place. Mm -hmm. There's companies that don't have publishing companies, but they would own the publishing theoretically if they if they did. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go ahead and collect your writer's portion, can you do that without assigning it to a publisher somewhere? Can you just, is, I don't think there's a way to do that, but do you just assign the publishing to yourself and hope for the best, or what's the best way to go about that? Usually, I mean, most songwriters I know have their own publishing companies for that specific purpose, because... Right. You can't, I mean, theoretically, if you're working for a company, you can't be the publisher. Yeah, the, yeah that's true. Um, if you are an employee, then, the, then the, the company itself would be the publisher. Right. So that would be so. So. As but if far they as don't have a publishing company, then you're just stuck. Those writers' rights are out there without just sitting there for for no one. If if there if there if there's most game studios, if if they want to be able to collect because they're going to want the money too, they're going to be entitled to a cut as well. So they will typically you know set up a publishing a publishing sector, or they'll at least register with the performance rights organizations as a publisher for that specific purpose. So. So I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, I, I'm not saying they always they'll always do that, but yeah, they yeah. should. <laughs> and so, at sometimes that point, they don't want the hassle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I understand. Um, at that point, you'd want to register independently. I mean, you'd, you'd probably want to register independently with the performance right organization as a songwriter, uh, just to make sure that you're at least entitled to your cut. Or can you, you not? You can't. You have to register you, the, publisher the publisher at that time. Hmm. So that's good question. You're just stuck out there. I mean, it's. Yeah, at that one, and again, it comes down, and, and a lot of this issue is be, uh, often because most game developers don't really acknowledge that they uh, are required to pay out performance rights, or that their, uh, or that you know their incorporation of music in their in their products constitutes a public performance. So they're not always sure when performance rights are going to be an issue, which is probably why they don't you know take that route in the first place, and they don't necessarily understand that they are entitled to certain publishing royalties as a result of public performances. So yeah, it's it's that's a problem and I mean it's something that you're going to have to address with the company. Uh there I mean there's if they are the the uh, the purported publisher unless they are willing to register with a performing rights organization, you're not going to have uh much luck getting that writer share. So um, you kind of want to have that in your agreement as well. And uh, I think that's it. I don't think I have any more time. But if you guys have any other questions, feel free to grab me. Thank you very much.